All right, so let's get started for today's seminar. I'm uh, very happy to welcome my friend from Texas A&M, Dr. Ankit Srivastava. I and him actually overlapped bad at Texas when I was a postdoc. He was a new faculty there. We had a great time. Uh, so currently he's an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And uh, he has done his postdoc at Brown University with Alan Bauer. And his PhD was in physics and material science and engineering with Alan Needleman at UNT, University of North Texas. He has several awards in his name. Uh, his main area of research is mechanics of materials, that is parent discipline. He has several awards to his name, including the ACS uh, PRF Doctoral New Investigator Award, the ACME AMD Foundation Award, the NSF Career Award, the 2022 and 2021 are the ASI, AISI finalist medals, uh, and more recently, the TMS AM, AIME Robert Lansing. So with that, I welcome Ankit, and uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Ankit. Uh, there is a similarity in our names, uh, but there is a very subtle difference between me and Kumar. Uh, my first name is Ankit, and his last name is right. So if you, <laughs> and my students call me Dr. Ankit, I said that would not be right, because you would have to call me Dr. Shirvastu, or just call me Ankit. But calling him Dr. Ankit right, will be actually right, because <laughs> his last name is right. On full layer within a hexagon system. So it's a simple hexagon subject. You have uh, A layer, MX layer, A layer, MX layer. Now, this MX layer can have different configurations. So you can have two layers of M and one layer of carbon, or you can have three layers of M and two layers of carbon. So you can have different stacking sequence. What we're going to call it that 211, that means two layers of M, one layer of A, 312, 413, and so forth. Okay. Uh, okay. It's not that complicated in, in, in this own way, but now this layer structure. Yeah. All right, the layer structure gives you a nice talk. Now, if you have the layer structure like this, this is a single layer of metal. This is MX, which is pretty much like a, a carbide. You know, carbides are strong, they're covalently bonded material, they're a strong bond. So, this is MX, which is either a metal carbide or metal nitride. So, this layer is very strong, right? They're covalently bonded on the strongest primary bond. This layer alone within the inter layer is a metallic bond, which is not as strong as covalent bond. So now you have this MX and this layer. So you have this interlayer bonds, which are rather very weak bonds. So you have a plane of atoms, or, or three or four planes of atom that are strongly bonded, very strong. One plane, which is okay, weakly bonded. Between the plane, bonding is very weak, but they're still stronger than what we call secondary bonds. So they are still primary bond, mixed character between covalent and metals, but other weak. So what this structure does to this material now that you can slide them as a deck of cards. Uh, they can twist the layers, so you can slide, twist, but they're also very weak. So you pull them apart, they just break into different layers. Uh, and then you can have the crack running through it as well. Everything eventually breaks. If you apply a lot of stress or bend each layer, it will eventually crack too. So you can, between layer cracks, cracks running through the layer, you can take these layers and you can crumble them. So they form these ripples. They also do this interesting feature called kinking. So you take the layer, you compress it, and they form a kink like in a ge uh, geological structure. So interesting crystal structure, different types of layers, different types of bonding, and they give you plethora of uh, deformation mechanism. All right, so what they're good for? Well, initially were proposed that now since you have metal layer and ceramic layer, so they're properties of both. Uh, the idea was they probably will capture the best of both the worlds. To an extent they did, they're doing somewhat. So they are metals, like they are thermal electrical conductors. They are very damage tolerant. They are resistant to thermal shock. They are machinable. You can simply machine them. I'll show you a picture here of machining them, like metal. Uh, but they are still ceramics. So they are very good oxidation and corrosion resistant. Oxidation, okay, we can argue about that one, but they are very good corrosion resistant in uh, any environment other than oxidizing environment. They are refractory, very low density, high stiffness, very low thermal expansion. So I want to first the review paper. This max phase idea uh, in, in its bulk form was originated by a person named Michel Barsoom, uh, who likes to drink and party a lot. And that's why I discovered cool things. Uh, and this one review paper, the title speaks for itself. When they came up with this, they started to characterize the properties of this material. It was very clear at the moment, while well, bridging the gap between metals and ceramic. And I have a material that bridges without actually making it a composite. All right, uh, I do mechanical behavioral material. None of the property makes sense to me other than one, damage tolerant. This material has no reason to be damage tolerant. You have such a weak clear. Can you take a deck of cards and make it damage tolerant? Intuitively, it doesn't make at all any sense. So for our idea, it was like, okay, why this material is damage tolerant? And what I mean by damage tolerant, I'll show you here. First, because there is only one weak layer, 
material deforms along that layer. So think about a recipe structure, you slide, right? You can take a deck of cards, slide this way. You try to compress parallel to the layer, you can't. It's not gonna go deformation, it's not gonna slide easy. So that structure by its own nature is anisotropic. Uh, what did happen to this? This material forms in the polycrystalline structure. So a lot of grains with arranged within. Now, if you align grains in a certain way, the material can be very ductile. This is room temperature stress strain response. Well, ductility here is uh, slightly confusing because if you are a metallurgist, unless you do tension, there is, you don't define ductility. In ceramics, if a material does deform plastically even under compression, it's uh, what we call graceful material. <laughs> so this is compression, but even compression, uh, a carbide, binary carbide would not sustain 10% of strength. So for certain orientation, it's rather ductile or undergo very nice plastic deformation. Some orientation, you go here, drops, but it still stays, doesn't easily fail. And one of the reasons everybody said, well, fine, because it's hexagonal structure, hexagonal structure. And uh, so you do have basal planes and it slips along basal plane. So basal plane plasticity causes this material to be uh, somewhat ductile. But then if you have basal slip system, you only have three out of three, it's only two independent slip system. Two independent slip system is not sufficient to give any plasticity to any material, right? So that is there, but it may not be the one that gives you damage tolerance. Uh, but even if you have slip, I just mentioned that these layers are very weak, right? The interlayer bonding is very, very weak. So why the material is damage tolerant? In polycrystalline form, this is a material at room temperature loaded in compression, and it didn't break into pieces like most carbide, like all carbides and nitrides will do. It stayed intact with a lot of damage. Damage tolerance doesn't mean the material would not have damage or cracking. It just means you will have crack, they will not connect to each other, and the material will not undergo catastrophic fracture. Cyclic loading, the same thing. You see a lot of cracks, and then small cracks that all there confined, and material somewhat holds its structural integrity. All right, so despite weak bond, despite limited number of slip, the material is very damage tolerant. So this is the one idea was that why this material stays damage tolerant. First thing to understand why what happens at the grain level, because this material is polycrystalline. If we understand what happens in single crystal, we can then maybe design the texture or all other parts just to write proposals. But most of the point, I didn't want to understand what is happening at single crystal plastic level and why this material is damage tolerant. So how do you start? Uh, the first set of experimental results I'm gonna show, uh, present is we got micro pillar compression experiment. I'm just gonna play two videos from YouTube. Uh, one comes from Jeff Wheeler and another one is Julia Greer. Uh, just to show you what these are, if you have never seen a micro pillar, which can doubt, ASU has a great micro capacity. Uh, you take the sample and you take the iron beam and you bombard the material with iron beam and you create a tiny pillar. I say that in this case, a diamond, uh, diameter of one micron, height of say two micron, three micron. Then you put it inside a nano indenter and you take a flash flat punch indenter and you compress it. So you're basically doing a small scale compression test. What you get is the force displacement response. You normalize them in the cross-section area. And now you have engineering compressive stress compressive strain response. So we said, okay, we'll do that. But we were not the first one. The couple of papers were already published when they try to do pillar compression experiment of max phases. These are very expensive, very sophisticated experiments. So of course, the early papers were focused on one grain, two grain. So they didn't really build up much onto uh, doing, understanding the orientation dependent response. How do you analyze one slip system, two slip system, cracking and all this. So we took these, we had the idea of like, okay, we're gonna build uh, a large set of data in single crystal. So this is this material is a polycrystalline again. Like when I'm giving an example of deck of card, you're just thinking one deck of card. Just think about a bunch of deck of card arranged in the grid. So, and this crystallizes like this brick. So it's not a typical metal or ceramic uh, polycrystalline grain structure. The grains are like really long, uh, like brick. And we make this material through uh, simply sintering. And then once the material is made, we anneal the heck out of it to grow the grains as much as we can. So we can make pillar out of it. So we have this. We know the grain orientation. Now I'm gonna go and just, or my student went and start making pillars in each grain. Uh, so we can take this grain, we know the orientation, we made the pillar and we'll deform that. We, we have some more knowledge than the videos I showed. So we made large pillars. If you make smaller pillar, you get what we call a spurious 
high strength or smaller is stronger effect. But we know if we make a pillar which is greater than five micron, 10 micron, you don't get to, you don't have to worry about size effect. And you may luckily enough capture the response of the bulk from the tiny pillar. So we made reasonably large pillar, spent a lot of money making this whole large pillar, milling large pillars is not that easy. Uh, but we got to make really nice cylindrical pillar, with 10 micron diameter, 20 micron height from multiple grains. So this example is a one max phase where M is titanium, A is aluminum and carbon. So this is titanium aluminum carbide and the stacking is two, one, one. All right, then uh, we have the orientation at CP. You get the three angles, three Euler angles, P1, P and P2. P tells you how the basal is oriented, but you also need to know how the slip direction is oriented. Slip occurs on the plane in a direction that lies on the plane. Uh, since SCP doesn't inherently has an orthogonal basis, dealing with vectors is not easy. You need orthogonal vectors. So before, when we started to do, we started to get experimental results that didn't make sense. So we started to go back and check out maths. So I'm gonna present a bunch of equations. Maybe you will find it exciting. If not, all I'm gonna convince myself that I didn't screw up and doing the analysis. So this is my pillar. I know the orientation of a bunch of pillar. They all have name. B will be blue, Y will be yellow. And all I'm interested in finding the orientation of the crystal with respect to my loading direction. Once I have that, I can then find out if I'm compressing along this direction, it's gonna slip on this plane. Let's assume this is basal in the direction of this blue line, which will be the slip direction. Uh, I need to find out what is this resolved shear stress, right? In simple plasticity from crystallographic slip, Resolved shear stress will exceed a critical value at, say, room temperature. That will be a real parameter. And if that exceeds that value, these will start to climb. Right? All right. So we started that. <laughs> okay. So you start with this. You know, I write it as material only has a basal slip system. All right. So, okay. Okay. So you only have basal slip system. This is your basal plane, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, triple zero, 1, and this is your uh, slip direction, 1, 1, bar to 0. Uh, you take these, convert into orthogonal basis. 0, 0, 1 is straightforward because basal plane normal is 0, 0, 1, so there will be simply double zero one. 1, uh, ijk, single vector. 1, 1, bar to 0, you have to do a little bit trick to convert them to orthogonal basis, uh, but it's nothing something that we started to do the maths. We just went sure to find the math is right. And all we found that a lot of people dealing with SCP do it wrong. So we're like, okay, fine. We have to rederive. Uh, they start from the forefathers of crystal plasticity and build it again. All right. So this, this is what you will get. Uh, you will have three, uh, your unit vector for plane normal. You will have unit vector for slip direction, which now needs to be rotated with these three Euler angles. And you find the resolved shear stress or what we would call a Schmidt factor for now. I'll just skip this math, not that big deal. You get the rotation tensor, this is standard. You can find it in any EBSD manual, that's not a big deal. Uh, then we got our uh, Schmidt factor mu, which is nothing but the, the two angle, cos phi uh, uh, and cos psi. And this factor when multiplied by my loading axis, loading stress sigma or force, anyway, sigma times this uh, mu will give me the resolved shear stress tau RSS. All right, so once I have that value, I'm going to show you a table. I hate tables, but just to highlight, uh, we made pillars knowingly from different orientations such that we got the value of the Schmidt factor, zero, almost zero, 2.45. That means that if I take a pillar and I'm loading the pillar, say up to 100 megapascal, the resolved shear stress in this pillar is zero or close to zero, right? It's not going to slip. I can load that pillar all the way up to one gigapascal, the resolved shear stress would still be zero and the pillar will not slip. If I put five and I'm loading 200 megapascal, the resolved shear stress is close to 50 megapascal. And if that exceeds the critical resolved shear stress, that will slip. And this is what we call the famous Schmidt factor or Schmidt law uh, that is basically led the foundation of plasticity in metals. All right, we got that. Now I'm going to show you this stress strain curves uh, for this orange. Just highlight those. This is Y1, which is Schmidt factor of 0.44, Y3, 0.45, and O1, which is 0.27. So you see the pillar that has lower Schmidt factor start to show yielding plastic flow at higher stress because the resolved shear stress is not felt yet, right? So this start to undergo plastic flow at higher value. This one started at lower values. These two started closely, but they bifurcate after large deformation. And this is how my deformed pillars look like. Uh, once we deform, you can see these slip lines. This one is like a 
deck of poker chip compressed and it slides in a discrete fashion, uh, like sliding of poker chips. All right, we got this, but this is still not a metal. Just because it looks like slip doesn't have to be slip, right? So well, what you're gonna do find out is it slip or not? Well, first let's just look at it, how it looks like, right? Uh, all right. So we just start to image this whole thing. Is it cracked? It's just like a deck of when a deck of cards slides. It's not crystallographic slip. They just slide because they have no interaction. It's a decohesion. It's just sliding, right? So we start to look at just keep rotating. Look at how does it look like? Well, it feels like a slip. It's nicely attached. It's not stuck here. So it's still deformed, slid along the basal planes, but it's still there, right? So it looks like, okay, it's probably underwent slip, not some kind of deck of card type cohesive sliding. Second proof, without going to a TM, because we didn't want to go to TM, so I had no idea of TM, we started to do polish. All right, so we started to polish. If you, if a crystal undergoes crystallographic slip, right? We have full dislocation. The crystal structure will stay the same. So if I have the slip marking, I polish it inside the material, I should have the perfect crystal, right? And if, okay, this is not the scale you, I can claim anything about perfect crystal, but if I look at it and don't see any contrast, then it's probably the same grain. So we started to polish layer by layer and started to look at what is happening to slip marking. The slip marking started to disappear. That means the slip was actually a crystallographic slip. If it was a crack, I will have these hair lines that will never go away, right? Slip only leaves a marking on the free surface, not in the bulk of the material. All right, so it's clear it was a slip. And just to show again and again, it looks like a slip. Of course, one can then do TEM and fully confirm this thing, but we were happy with this, this much of confirmation. This is probably right. Okay, so next. Then now look at other pillars with lower Schmidt factors, like close to zero or 0.2. This one goes linearly up, drops quickly. This is not plasticity, this pillar just suspended. This one goes up and shows some kind of graceful failure, but you will see it's not actually plasticity either. Uh, so this one is B2, cracked, bended, but it was slow. So you got a little bit of plastic type behavior. Again, just because you see a curve doesn't really mean it's right, right? My student came back, oh, this one also ended in plastic deformations. I'm going the image. And this shows you clearly that it was not a plastic deformation. Fine. So we see the other one. This one also, this is showing that it cracked. And then we went further. This one cracked, simply split. Layers are like this. You take a piece of wood. You take an axe. It breaks into two pieces. That's pretty much it. Instead of axe, it was a punch I was compressing. All right. So these, and this one we loaded and unloaded just to make sure that we're getting everything right. The results are reproducible. We have many pillars that are in the same grain. So we have reproducible result for those things. All right. All right. I need to mute myself. This is nice. You get. That's how we survive. See? <laughs> oh, it's the speaker. All right. So uh, this is just a bunch of uh, these stress strain curves. When I look at this as a linear portion, I can then go back and find the yield strength of each pillar, right? Which is deviation from plasticity. Again, remember we're doing a very small scale test. It's not like an MTS machine. If you have done tensile tests, you get a better clear signature. These ones, we never get any clear signature. So, but we can cook up something and find the yield strength. We did find some, some ways. So we identify the onset of nonlinearity and we're gonna call them yield point per pillar, all right? Now I have these pillars with the Schmidt factor. I know these yield points. So let's look at what's going on with two pillars, the yellow and the R1 red. Once we have these two, uh, these two pillars, this one, uh, R1 yields at 295 megapascal, and Y2 yields at 42.3. I know there's Schmidt factor. I can multiply Schmidt factor with this value, and I should get one unique number of critical resolved shear strength. That is the material property. So I should get just one, which in metallurgy will depend on the pulse Navarro stress barrier. 
that is the property of the structure itself. But if I do this R1 pillar, I get a different value. So for Y2, I get 18.6 18 megapascal. For R1, I get 97.6 megapascal. Big difference. This number should have been the same. That was the Schmidt law. That any given time, you take the stress, multiply the Schmidt factor, it must reach a critical value, which is a material property for plastic to occur. All right, so it doesn't follow classical Schmidt law. Fine, this is why I was showing maths, because when I make this claim that doesn't follow classical Schmidt law, metallurgists will yell at me. All right, so what it does, this is the pillar I'm compressing. These are my... All right, this is the basal plane. This is my slip direction. These are the angles, which I can get from the vectors. Now I have the vectors on an orthonormal basis, and I find resolved shear stress. What we found out, this resolved shear stress simply sigma times stress. I'm just repeating the equations. Then we said, okay, if it is not sliding, it's acting like friction, right? You have a friction coefficient, you increase the normal stress, friction sliding becomes harder. For lack of anything, uh, we just said, okay, fine, there's a normal stress. If I apply sigma, there's a result shear stress, there's a normal stress. And this normal stress is nothing but cos squared psi. Again, psi and lambda I know because I have orientation of each grain. So I define a sigma normal, I define a result shear stress. And then for all these pillars, I'm going to just plot the value. This is nothing but sigma y times Schmidt factor. This is the normal stress, which is sigma applied, multiplied by cos squared psi. You plot, you get a linear relationship. Classical metallurgy, when it was started in 1940s, uh, with the beautiful work from a metallurgist known Chipper, when she was doing her PhD, she will make these plots over and over again, and she will show for all FCC material, this tau CRSS will stay a straight line irrespective of sigma norm. And this is the basis that in, in metal plasticity, when you define yield criteria in terms of, say, one mesis or any other criteria, you say that hydrostatic pressure has no effect on plastic flow of the material. But in this case, it's not only dependent, it's a strong dependent. You see the line, it's a strong dependent on, on, on the normal stress. All right. So we get that. Uh, then we were like, okay, fine. This was one material. How about we change the stacking from 211 to 312, right? So now I have instead of one layer of titanium, two layer of titanium here and carbon, now three layer of titanium and two carbon, right? So this is titanium three, aluminum carbide two. So we take that, we do the exactly the same thing. Uh, but I'll just show one plot, which makes it uh, interesting. Titanium three, aluminum carbide for one set of grain orientation. And we are lucky to pinpoint the same grain. For one set of grain orientation, is stronger, yields at a higher, greater, greater stress than titanium two aluminum carbide, right? If I change, take different orientation, now titanium three aluminum carbide is softer than titanium two aluminum carbide. So it is depending on the orientation, three, three, uh, three, one, two is either stronger or a harder or softer than two, one, one. All right, what's going on here? We did a bunch of pillar after that when we found this interesting. Now we plot all of these values of their results shear stress versus normal stress. This is 211, this is 312. When this lower value of tau CRS means favorable slip orientation, this means non favorable slip orientation. So a non favorable slip orientation, 312 is softer, favorable slip orientation, 312 is harder. So 312, by its design itself, has a slightly greater unstable stacking fault energy. That means should have been stronger, harder than 211. But, and it is when the slip is favored, it is stronger, harder, although there's a lot of noise in data, but you zoom in, you do get a little bit stronger value. Okay, so this is harder and the other one is softer. Material follows non-Schmidt, great. Uh, now we can go back and model it. Mechanical behavior, we love to write the maths. So we follow simply uh, classical crystal plasticity relation. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just skip this whole maths. This is textbook. I'm just gonna the equation that we came up with. So what you have is a shear strain rate as a function of results, this tau alpha is a resolved shear stress. This is the shear strain rate. So in the classical crystal plasticity, it says that the resolved shear stress, right, and the shear strain rate, both are dependent. This is simply a classical plasticity model, right? You take the derivative of the yield surface, you get the strain, plastic strain, is a uh, increment in strain is a function of increment in stress. And this is basically the same thing. Instead of in written in incremental formulation, is it any rate formulation? So all I have to do is multiply by delta T and I get my classical incremental formulation back. All right, too much of garbage mechanics, but again, this is a very beautiful thing. So now you have this on the denominator, you have your hardening, G alpha. 
Now, if you take this GL5 and say, okay, this has now two terms. First term is classical hardening. Second term is non-classical hardening. Now, classical hardening will depend on cumulative plastic strain. Strain hardening in metallurgy comes from dislocation accumulation. That's accumulated plastic strain. So we take the classical relation and simply write it that this G, the rate of evolution of this G is a function of cumulative, Taylor cumulative shear strain. You can rewrite this thing in terms of a classical sigma epsilon notation too, but here is we're writing slip system by slip system. Now this one, which is non-classical hardening, we cooked up this, this term as a function that depends on the stress. Now this was in a way beautiful and confusing at the same time. Hardening depends on the imposed stress. That means it's only active when I have a stress active. If I have no stress, it goes back. Friction is only active when you have normal stress. You remove the normal stress, there is no friction. Just because there are friction coefficient between two blocks doesn't mean there is a friction unless you apply a normal force and then you try to slide it, right? So stress is there. If the stress is not, not there, there is no hardening. Stress is there, there is hardening, right? And then we, this, is, this is just elegant way of writing the math that we got from Kerfit. So nothing that, that big science here. And then we had to introduce this, uh, what's called heaviside function. That means when you apply normal stress, more than certain critical value, then effect of the friction goes away. It's kind of a stick slip scenario in, in friction. You apply too much, you deform the asperities, and then the friction slightly decreases. Uh, we don't know what's the origin of this thing, but I'll show you why we have to introduce this thing and why it was needed. All right, so we got all the term right, we put it in there, and we can predict all the pillars. For two materials with a simple equation, simple addition, we can predict many of these materials. Uh, I already knew, so what was the point of modeling? Uh, now I can go back and understand what will happen if I didn't have the non-Schmidt effect. What will be the response? I can also go back and understand and try to find, was there anything in the experiment that could have gone wrong that gave me this crazy result? So we did all those parametric study. I'm not gonna show that other than one thing. Why do I need a cutoff, right? So if I don't have this cutoff, this is how it will look like. So this is the response of three pillars of two, one, one. This is the response of three pillar for th uh, three, one, two, for three different orientations. For some orientation, this cutoff doesn't matter. They predict with and without cutoff, solid and dashed line the same. But if I don't put a cutoff for orientation that are more easily oriented for slip, you get slightly harder response. In some cases, a lot more harder response. So you must, the material follows a non-classical pattern where one component of hardening depends on imposed stress, but it has a cutoff value. If you exceed that, that hardening should vanish. What's the physics? No idea. <laughs> But the math must work out that way to give you the realistic experimental observation. That's it. All right. Then we like, okay, the material had big bonds. Some of the pillar cracked, right? So let's look what was happening to these pillars. Uh, we had these planes. This is the slip direction. I apply stress. Once I apply stress, the elasticity will give me strain. Now remember, these are free surfaces, right? So stress is only applied on the surface. And in this direction, I have zero stress. So I cannot have a stress for it to break. But I will have a strain because if I have zero stress, I must have the poison strain, right? If I have zero stress, I must have the strain. If I have zero strain, I must have the stress. That's the difference between plane stress and plane strain. All right. So I can find the strain from continuum mechanics. That will be sigma and that poison ratio. But this is not an isotropic material. And an isotropic strain would also not work because the separation of plane. So we said, okay, what are we going to do? I know the stress applied. I can just say applied stress is one megapascal take the compliance tensor and find the strain normal to normal to the basal plane. So this is my strain tensor that I get by taking an anisotropic elasticity. Then I get the strain normal to the basal plane. And then we plot this value as a function of the cos square psi, which is this, this cosine square of this, this angle. And see, there are some pillars orientation for which I have a positive value. That means they are trying to separate. Some, I have negative value. Again, this is just shows that tensor works very nicely. <laughs> that is, this was the intuition we already knew, but anyway, it was not bad doing it. So if the idea why I'm going to show this thing is that th this should have worked, right? It's the tensor. I, I rotate the tensor, I must get positive strain for it to break. But what I want to point out, even if you have a strain slightly greater than zero, a little bit positive, this thing breaks. So if you are applying deformation that activates slip, it slips, beautiful, right? But if you have slightly bit of tension normal to this plane, this thing just breaks. So again, why the heck this material is damage tolerant? 
slip was there. I got some scientific outcome out of it that the material follows non-Schmidt. Cool, great, fine. As a metallurgist, I was very excited. But then I also know a lot of other metals do, do, do not follow Schmidt law. But this material breaks so easily. So why this is damage tolerant? All right. So we were not done there yet. Uh, so if the values are positive, it breaks. They're negative, means you're compressing. They, it just can break, right? So what is happening? In a polycrystine material, when I look at these, a lot of damaged material stays. Each one, each grain starts to crack and it stays. One thing you see, when the, the cracks are never straight. The crack was forming along the basal plane. In one grain, basal plane is like this, let's say. In this grain, it could be like this. But through the grain, the basal plane has an orientation. They are parallel planes. Crack must have gone through the basal plane, parallel to the basal plane, should have stayed that way. But it's always kinks. So why does it kink? We know this material kinks. I showed you the information before that this material kinks. Uh, so what will kinking do to this material? Now, one thing we miss in the pillar experiment, it was freestanding pillars. If you know anything about mechanical testing, a simple idea, you need uniaxial loading condition, right? That's the beauty of mechanical testing, intention or compression. You know what you're imposing, one direction of force, right? That's why material science people love that one because you don't have to deal with tensors. You have F, you divide it by cross-section area, you get a value of stress. All engineers, entire industry works on that one. That's why we did the pillar. We will spend more money doing that one just to find out that it didn't answer our question. So let's take a material. This is your chromium carbide. This is purple is chromium. This is carbon. And these are aluminum layers. So instead of titanium two aluminum carbide, now we're going to talk about chromium aluminum carbide. Largely because you will just realize why we did chromium. Because we can get single crystals of these material at a larger scale. So now I can get single crystals of material that are two millimeter by two millimeter cube, just showing that this is 1.5 millimeter. So I can have two by two millimeter of cube. They are single crystal. I can put them in orientation I want. I can design a fixture, indent them, compress them, do whatever I want with them, right? And one thing interesting at this scale I can do when it, things are in millimeter, then you have more control. I can apply a constraint normal to the basal plane as a polycrystine material faces. So I can have unconstrained freestanding sample. I can have constraint. So we came up with this idea. We designed this test fixture. This is how it looks like. This is our setup. It's a small uh, tensile stage. Uh, well, tension, compression, fatigue. This could do a lot of things from a company called Kamrath & Weiss based in Germany. We bought this stage and then we basically took all the fixture, threw it apart. I was starting to build new fixture. What I have is a base. I have the sample here. I'm going to indent from this side. Now, then we design a new fixture. I have the sample constrained from both sides and we indent from here. You see, I can move this and there is epoxy layer between them to compress. Why epoxy layer? First, it's very difficult to handle this material without putting in a, some kind of soft confinement. Second, if I don't put epoxy and I move this hardened steel to compress it, I make it plain strain. That means no strain allowed and no volume change can be allowed along this direction, which you will see soon is important. All right, we have this fixture and then we start to deform it. So how does it look like? If I have a freestanding crystal, you can guess because you've seen the pillar, what will happen to this material. Don't read too much into these crazy curves because it's difficult to get a reliable force strength data. This is just to show how it was evolving. All is I have in this experiment is qualitative pictures. Uh, so you start from here. There was a defect in the crystal already. It broke, but that's fine. It won't do anything because this is not the load bearing section. Load bearing section is here. I go to higher force and then it boom, cracks, right? Then it starts to crack. Now this portion here have multiple crack. This region is start to be glued almost, right? You always have friction. So this friction reason is constraining this thing from moving further. And then what you see, if you zoom in here, you start to get these buckled ligaments. So you get multiple cracks, boom, 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 boom. And each ligament start to buckle, right? They're just buckling. Uh, and they all buckle, then we removed it. Once you remove this thing, all you get in the end is three broken pieces. This piece, this piece, this piece as a whole, this piece, this piece, and the piece that was separated from this side. And if I zoom in on this piece, this is a, a polarized light image, single color almost. No, we did EBSD too. It was a single crystal before, it stays single crystal. No change in orientation, nothing. All these things snapped back. So when you zoom it at this location, you will see hairline cracks, but everything snapped back and the material was again done. All right, if I do uh, constraint, now I'll start to look at the images. 
and I load progressively, keep doing one by one. You see this one crack start to form, then use a multiple crack. None of the crack besides this pre-existing defect that Crystal had, it started to grow. They form these cracks, see a bunch of crack, parallel cracks, and they're all in an inclined band. And you found more and more crack, more and more crack, but none of them grow through the material. I, all I did was put a thick layer of epoxy in a plier constraint. They all just started to go. And if you monitor this one uh, yellow arrow, it's a crack, opens, grows, opens more, and then starts to close and it's gone now. So it started to grow, open, open, and then it started to close, and by the end, it was gone. Then we finished the whole experiment all the way up to very high deformation, took it out, and we did the polarization. This is how it looks like. A single crystal became polycrystalline in a room temperature experiment. Uh, it was not ECAP, it was not metal, it has only two slip system, and it became a polycrystalline material. This is simply a polarized light. Of course, it's not sufficient. So I'll show you EBSD to confirm that it, the initial single crystal became a polycrystalline material during deformation. But just look at it, what, what was going on. These hairlines are some of these big cracks that were forming. They closed, but they're still there. So you can see them as a hairline. This is an eye-shaped polarized light. So there are two different grains here. Now, we put in the SEM, we look. There are cracks. They're not opening. This image is taken when the sample was taken out of the fixture, completely unloaded. So residual stressor should have snapped it back. It was still pre-existing crack. But it stayed held together even stronger than it was before as a single crystal. So now we start to look at this. Look, there are some cracks left along these, these, these lines. You have few cracks now and then, but not everywhere. All right. You can then draw these lines. Look at the boundary. The boundary in this case is alpha equals to 35. This beta here is 15. So this alpha is e approximately equal to 2 beta. Now, this is important. This alpha and beta relation is important. We'll talk about this soon. This structure then confirms that this is a kink band, which started in late 1800s, where you take the geological material, you compress them, and in the earth crust, you have confinement, and then earthquakes come, and they basically compress them. So this is the earth confinement. This is, say, earthquake, and they just crystal kinks. And these are kinked structure, right? So this was observed before. Uh, it has been seen in composites. Every time this happens, other than the earth crust, this is assumed to be a failure mechanism. An engineering composite compressed, kinked, fails. So, this case, we see it, the crystal at least didn't fail. Now, going forward, just to show this was indeed polycrystallization, this is an EBSD result. When I show you these orientation map, to draw a line, you can plot the orientation, hexagon schematic of P, Q, R, S. This was my initial crystal. So even if I have formed a bunch of these uh, kink, kink grains, I still have regions that are still the original uh, orientation. And then you see these two, right? If you just look at, look at this Q and R, even this large two by two millimeter crystal, my student went and did one EBSD and came back. The conclusion was, this is a twin. You look at this is a twin. Unless you start to do more and more and realize that was by one chance, the orientation matches a twin orientation. So it is no way twin. So repeated experiments again and again. All right, then we can look at the, what, why this is rotating. Whenever it rotates, the Smith factor in that grain increases. So basically it's trying to rotate to initiate plasticity. The planes were like this, I'm compressing, there is no driving force for it to slip. It kinks, cracks, kinks, and now it has a driving force and it has start to undergo plastic deformation. All right, that's not that a big deal. I'm going to show you, I'm only end or I have, I have 20 minutes? All right, she's more bored than the students. Now you owe me a beer after this. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can never read the student faces because I stopped doing it since I became faculty. If I look around my own class, faces of a student, and try to guess, do they really, are they really understanding? Do they really like me? I'll probably never teach again in my life. <laughs> so I look at student faces, I completely stop. Like, fine. Uh, all right. Uh, so now we look at what is happening near the indenter. This is what we started with. These are cracks that start to form. We do more, more and more cracks. So more and more cracks started to form. And then these open, none of them are growing though. We have a little bit of confinement from simple mechanics. I had a say, a zone, which is weak plane. I apply some confinement. Then I have applied load, right? And I have confinement. So basically I reduce the driving force already. So it's not growing, not a big deal. As of now, this crack is not going, is not something making me very excited. 
right? Because it is supposed to be, I applied a confinement, I have de decreased the driving force. What gets exciting is that these cracks start to open up and then the ligament between the two cracks start to rotate. Keep watching this, keep starting to rotate. And then these cracks started to close. This became exciting. Now this one long crack shoots another of these bands and have many cracks. This crack is here, close this crack. In ceramics, in classical ceramics, bulk, say titanium carbide, right? Binary carbide. One of the failure mechanisms proposed by back in the days by Ali Argan, it's a seminal paper. You have a ceramic, say you have a pore, you compress it. The pore gets under compression and shoots up two cracks like the aircraft wing, all called wing crack. If I just look at this moment, we pause, this looks like wing crack, right? If I had not seen this crack before, that this was a straight crack before, and I just look at this point, it will look like wing cavity. So basically what I'm saying, when you start to do an in-situ experiment, you start to see things, you start to characterize things, and you can believe whatever you want, right? Just if you don't look at more. So just look at here, this is a wing crack. A classical paper, a beautiful paper, I can go and cite it, and I can get done with this one image, calling it wing crack. All right, so these are the crack forms. This, this is the crack that started to separate away. So now it's clear, it's not a wing crack, right? It was initial one big crack. The material between this crack starts to rotate close the crack, the portion that lied within the band, I continue to cross. And then this thing will start to expand. The boundary started to expand. So let's say, let's agree, we're gonna call this king band. A king band started to form, it opens up. And then when the king band is forming, the crack that lies within the king band started to close. So crack formed, ligament rotated, kinked, a king band forms, and it started to close the crack. All right, so we can then go back and draw all the angles, right, for each one of them. So this is alpha equals to beta. This is alpha. Now alpha is increasing. Beta is kind of increasing slowly. And at this point, alpha is actually equal to two beta. Now, I'll come back to this, why this is interesting. All right, let's look at more because I just got 10 minutes. So let's look at more images. This is was a plain gray piece of material. Oh, okay, so I didn't really get 10 minutes. <laughs> I think at one of the MRS meetings, they had a the speaker went over the time, they will start to play music, <laughs> very loud music to stop them. <laughs> All right. Uh, so th this is it. I'm not going to go too much. Don't worry. This is almost it. So you look, start look at it. You found these cracks. They're always inclined, right? So are they cracked? Initial crack that was coming from the indenter, this is we're looking far away from the indenter. These cracks might be forming because this band is forming. The material wants to form the band and thus it is forming crack. The crack that we saw first near the indenter were the cracks that it has to form because there's nothing else it can do, right? You are deforming it in a direction that it can't do anything. It can slip, but I'm still gonna deform the material. So it has to do something. These cracks, no, this is uh, slightly away from the indenter. By distance, yeah. So I have, let's say this was a sample. I have my indenter here, indenting. And when I'm indenting it, the initial image I showed you was just beneath the indenter. This one is slightly below that. So it's forming band like this, 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 this. So this one, we're capturing a band that just happened to start. Uh, so this is, indenter is far away. So basically the, the huge gradient of loading that would, have, that would have built up because of indenter is not building up here. And by indenter was cylindrical, right? So cylindrical indenter, I'm indenting. And then it starts to form these cracks. So these cracks are, probably only forming because the band wants to form. And that was the beauty of this band is. Uh, I'm just gonna do all the angles and then go back. All right. This is my last attempt. If it, after this, I'll just. Okay. So, if you assume this material to have these planes, basal planes to be inextensible, this is carbide, so probably not undergoing much extension. And you assume there is no deformation out of the plane. We know both of them are very strong assumption. But if you make that assumption, then you can come up with the definition of shear strain that occurs in this band because it's rotating and change in volume that it has to go through for this band to form. If you plot this, and you plot this alpha versus these values of alpha and beta, when Alpha and beta are approaching, alpha is approaching two beta at this location. This delta V goes to zero. 
before it is not like before alpha and beta is equal right if alpha beta is equal you will have large volume change then when alpha and beta start to go closer the volume change increases then it starts to decrease so this will be a function like this as a function of say constant alpha and beta changes so at one point the volume must increase in a deformation of a crystal the volume change only occurs in elastic deformation the plasticity because of crystallography doesn't cause doesn't lead to any volume change right well this material doesn't follow its mid law so we don't know really what's going on but there cannot be a volume change even if material has some way of some unique mechanism of plastic deformation that will require volume change uh, you cannot sustain this volume change thus the material must crack but for material to start to form this band it must have instability so it cracks before it start to become unstable trigger the band once the band triggers it forms the secondary cracks that it must because it has to accommodate the volume change once the band starts to develop and stabilize itself this volume starts to decrease goes to zero and if i continue to rotate it it will may go mathematically it will go below zero uh, like this will start to compress but again a crystal you can't really compress them so at this point its volume logs and all the cracks have closed so crack formed triggered band forms volume more cracks form and then volume start to recur the mechanics beautifully played out to first form crack band more crack and closure of all the cracks and just to give you one example if i compare a king crystal versus a single crystal there is response the king crystal has a higher strength and undergoes more graceful failure than a single crystal single crystal planes were parallel they all cracked and this is loaded not using an indenter but the beautiful uniaxial compression that we like and this one is no more a single crystal the basal is not running all the way these are all polycrystalline so the pre existing cracks barely open this was all the crack that formed kinged form the polycrystalline structure but none of them will open it will just you will see they will open never grow all the way i keep compressing them and it stays that way all right that's pretty much it in conclusion i will just say i have no idea why it is not smith and i have no idea what it happened why it kinked but we know if it kinked it closed the crack and thus why the material is stuck but the kinking is not unique to max phases you can have plethora of material that has a kinking that undergo kinking so basic idea if we could understand the competition of cracking and slip in these materials we can probably create material that are better uh, and more and so better toughening and damage tolerance that's it thank you